This is episode number 101. How did that happen? Wow. Featuring artist Barbara Tapp. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, announcer Jim Kipping. This podcast is brought to you by the Plein Air Convention and Expo. It is the world's largest plein air event. It's coming up in San Francisco and wine country in April, and we're painting some amazing places. We've had a lot of people who discovered us through this podcast who showed up the last couple of years, never had painted before in their life, showed up and learned, uh, got their basics down, went outside, did their first plein air painting, and left a better painter with a lot of information about the plein air movement, the scene, and uh, felt like they made a lot of friends and a lot of progress. So we hope you'll come. If you haven't thought about it, uh, this is a good year to come because San Francisco is the number one tourist location in America. It's the place everybody wants to go, and uh, it seems to be everybody's going to be coming to this one. So we still have some space left, but we have over 80 top master artists that will be there. Uh, not all have even been announced yet. We'll trickle them out a little at a time, but you want to get your seats. We have the world's best watercolor artist, Joe Zabukvik. He's going to be featuring, uh, be featured on stage, but he's also doing a pre-convention workshop. Also have a pre-convention workshop from the amazing Joseph McGurl, one of the top painters in America, uh, each doing pre-convention workshops and on stage, and a great staff of, uh, not staff, but team of uh, painters who are going to be out there working with you in the field and uh, working on four stages. You've got the big screens, so you've got watercolor, oil, pastel, acrylic, demo, all kinds of different things going on. And uh, we'll be painting together every day. It's historic, it's a lot of fun, and you will... Be with your tribe, and that's what matters. Learn more at plenairconvention.com. The interview is also brought to you by Streamline Premium Art Video. They do instruction videos, and um, we love them. Check out the amazing lineup of top artists at streamlineartvideo.com. Coming up after the interview, I'll be answering questions about art marketing in the Marketing Minute. But first, let's get to the interview with Barbara Tapp. You're going to hear her name a lot. Barbara Tapp, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Hi there, Eric. Good morning. It's really interesting. I've, uh, you and I got to know each other originally because of uh, Fall Color Week. Is that right? Yeah, it was an amazing entry into plein air painting for me. What, what's really been fun for me is when we do these events uh, like the Adirondacks Fall Color and so on, which are basically painting events for those who don't know, um, <clears throat> I, keep, I end up making a lot of new friends, and you're one of the the great benefits that I've taken <laughs> from from doing those events, you know, there's forty or fifty, or sometimes more people at them, and um, you know, we became fast friends very quickly. Yeah, we did. We really did. It, it was a a very interesting exposure. I'd never been to summer camp, and uh, you know, my kids, I'm Australian. My husband's Australian, and the kids were raised here. Uh, with the whole summer camp thing. And so when I saw you were providing a plein air summer camp to me, I thought, wow, my first time I can go. I may be 60, but uh, here I go. And it was great. <laughs> well, it's, it was a lot of fun. So we'll, we'll probably talk about that later. But I, I want to kind of, um, I, I'm curious how you got from Australia to the United States. How did that all occur? Um, in in Australia, uh, my husband and I both studied in architectural backgrounds and uh, a lot of Australians take off and travel for an extended trip, um, which we did when I was 24, he was 26. And we traveled around the world for 18 months. We actually worked only for four months of that. Um, and when we came back through the United States, uh, we caught a Greyhound bus horrible 36 hours straight uh, from New York to San Francisco and when we took a look at San Francisco there was timber construction being used and Richard said well 
let's go and see about seeing if I can find some work. And he landed a job here, and we came back. Um, and the rest was history. That's 38 years ago. What does timber construction have to do with it? Timber construction. In Australia, all the houses are built in brick. And here, because it's earthquake country, uh, all the houses are built in timber construction. So it's a very different form of uh, domestic architecture. I see. Okay. So were you an artist at that time? I, I, you said you were, an, you, you were in architecture. What were you doing specifically? I was an interior design graduate, and, um, but I've always had a passion for drawing. I've been a, uh, a good little girl. I always drew in books. I'm a graduate of uh, coloring books and dot-to-dots and all of those sorts of things. That's where <laughs> I got most of my coloring training from. Um, but then in, I did interior design, which was a four-year degree, which had a component of graphics and art and life drawing in it and was able to sort of dabble a little bit in painting, but not much. Um, But I did get a very strong architectural drafting of four years um, experience, which I then turned into an architectural drafting uh, career, actually, as an illustrator. uh, Okay, so uh, I need to understand that a little bit more. You said architectural drafting. So would you take what the architect was designing and then create, um, an image of the exterior of the house, uh, or what, what exactly would, would, would that look like? Uh, yes, that's exactly right. We, I would do perspective renderings from plans and elevations. Um, I could also draw up houses, the plans and elevations. Uh, I also did studied building construction. So when I was presented with anything to do with a building, uh, be a high-rise or a house, um, I can do a perspective rendering from scratch from that without computers. And, of course, computers changed all that, didn't they? They did, but luckily they have not affected me. I've managed to keep a career going uh, as a full-time illustrator uh, the whole time while the computer industry and in CAD has come to life. Um, there's a demand for hand-drawn illustrations. And, and how are those illustrations being used? Um, are, are they being used for ads for houses or for brochures? Or how, how does... Uh, diff- yeah, it's, I'm very lucky. Um, you know how sometimes fate intervenes into your life. Um, I made a connection here. I was uh, illustrating travel books and donated uh, five of these travel books to a fundraiser at the local um, kindergarten. And a real estate agent saw the books and came to me one day in the street and said, look, if you can draw hotels, do you think you could draw a house? And uh, the East Bay of San Francisco has a unique marketing that they prefer to use or have. It's it's declined a bit, but I'm still drawing at least five to six houses a week. Um, So on the brochures and also in the Chronicle newspaper and also on the MLS listing, they use illustrations, um, and this stands out in a different way com- uh, competing against photographs. Uh, and, and so you're, you're making a living doing that. And so I how, sure have. So how did you make this transition? You you're obviously haven't trans- transitioned away from that, or you still, you're still doing that, but you made a transition to becoming a plein air painter. How, how did that happen? Having sat at a desk, um, drafting and also uh, for so many long years of uh, drawing these houses and also having gone to visit each one of these houses. I mean, at my most, the I produce 60 houses in a week. What? So sometimes, yes. Um, yeah, it was like a factory. Uh, now I just, I increased my prices and then I dropped the volume. But um, it was an amazing career ex- as far as actually being able to put kids through school. So you, um, were, you were kind of doing plein air painting anyway. So would you set up an easel or, or a sketch pad in front of that house and then just do a, a rendering? No, <laughs> definitely not. No, I took this up when Kodak came out with their first digital camera. Um, prior to that, I had a Pentax from uh, high school that I used to use. And so I'd take my own photographs. It's not profitable. Eric to be in the street um, because 
people disturb you um, and I'm very much a widget person. I'm a person who likes to turn around volume when I'm working and be very efficient. This is the way I did my hotels for the books. Um, so I could manage doing a couple of houses in the morning, run errands, come back, do a couple of houses, take photographs, do all the carpooling with kids, and then maybe a couple of sketches late at night. And um, that's how I sort of wove that into my life. But plein air painting came into existence because uh, with the decline in the economy, that also affected the demand for sale of houses. And I had always wanted to be a painter and my middle son Alexander had encouraged me mum why don't you paint why don't you paint for yourself why don't why are you always working for other people and um, I just decided that I needed to sort of go and explore and had a French easel that I had been given and it had been sitting in the corner of my studio um, took a workshop with Georgia Manser uh, who was a wonderful t uh, painter, and the rest is history. That's seven years ago. Yeah, so a lot has happened to you in seven years. You, you've you had, uh, <laughs> you, you know, you've kind of gone from zero to 60 very quickly. Uh, yeah. you, you're winning a lot of awards. You've been in a lot of shows. You you are getting a lot of attention. Uh, and, and so obviously the quality was recognized fast, and I guess that, that quality started with the rendering of houses. But yeah. I, I would assume that you also have to kind of be careful about that because that's so very technical in nature. How do you walk that bridge between ah, being artistic a, and, and being um, uh, technical? Very good question. Uh, so I'm basically a drawer. I've drawn with line ever since I was a child. And a painter uses a brush. So the line really only comes into play at the end when you're doing all your decorating. Uh, it's been a very difficult transition to become a painter. And my goal right from the get-go was to not be an illustrator. Uh, it's very hard to not do everything accurately, um, to allow your imagination to come in to the paintings when you, or the scenes that you're seeing, to be the editor and... I've never been the editor. I've always been having to draw exactly what was there, not so that it's photographic. It's my interpretation through technique. But it, it had to be accurate. Windows had to line up. In this case, I've only through the years of the seven years of experimenting and pushing myself and uh, going to um, reading books, uh, meeting other artists, joining the California Art Club and meeting people and going in plein air painting, have I started to see what other painters were doing and how they were actually doing it. Um, and that, plus the time, has really helped me become a painter. I think I'm becoming a painter now. You know, a Asher B. Durand, uh, who, who was a f the famous uh, Hudson River School painter, was uh, an etcher before he was a painter. And he was one of the best etchers. And if you read his his uh, crayon documents, he had a publication that he did. He talked about how he had such a hard time letting go of mm -hmm. the exactness of the technique uh, because in etching it was, you know, it was very, very exact. And even though his paintings are tight, they're loose in comparison. So it sounds like you've gone through kind of a similar exercise. I, I, I agree with you. Um, it's interesting. I think you could you go full circle. When I first began, I painted in a studio. I, I got a studio and I painted abstract all from my imagination. And um, it was much easier to do that. But then when I stepped outdoors to, to plein air paint, I went backwards and started to record exactly what was there. And what I found in the technique, uh, this full circle has occurred where I went from the somewhat abstract approach to then this very tight, very realistic, put every dot in and, and the door handle on the, the doors. And... I realized that I was just boxing myself in. My paintings were taking six hours to do in the field and the conditions changed so radically 
you know, can be warm in the morning and then by the time you finish six hours later it might be raining and freezing cold. Um, so I started to speed my process up and my paintings now take only two hours, two and a half hours. They're far more um, abstract in the way that they begin and then I come in with my calligraphy, which is my drawing, at the end. And I think that's where I've now embraced my ability to draw and my love of drawing. But it only comes in at the end, and it's, um, it's really an exciting part of the painting. Well, that's really a reverse process from what you see from most watercolor painters who use line, is they usually lay down the line first mm -hmm. and then kind of fill in from there. No, not me. <laughs> I love to be really wild and experimental at the beginning part. Um, the middle part becomes very, almost I uh, become underwhelmed at the middle stage of the paintings. I, I only loosely put in a very light sketch in my initial watercolors. Um, and then I go in with trying to pull as many colors from all over in this initial abstract uh, part of it. Um, at the plein air convention that you did in San Diego, uh, I think Quang Ho gave a demonstration. Am I correct? Yes. It was in San Diego? Okay. He talked about light, all the different sources of light. And when I'm painting in plein air, that initial abstract set of washes and colors that I put down I try to think of all the different sources of light and all the different colors of light. So he, he talked about, you know, there being lavender in, in some parts of it that were reflected. It was a snow scene that he was doing. I haven't forgotten that. I take that with me and I hear him talking every time I start any plein air painting now. I want to probe back. I want to go back and probe something else that you said because I think it's an important thing. You know, we're we're up to, I don't know, four hundred fifty thousand listeners on this podcast now. It's just it blows my mind. I just can't even believe it. I didn't know there were that many people in the world interested in plein air painting. <laughs> you, you know, there are a lot of people who are kind of uh, sure. interested in finding out more, learning more, trying to kind of jump into it where where they can go. And you said something about. You didn't know anybody, you didn't know anything about any of this, and you kind of found your way by joining a couple organizations and so on. What's the best advice you would give to somebody who who says, okay, I want to I want to pursue this plein air painting thing. I want to learn a little bit more about it. I, I want to find out who the people are. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I was like you when I first got into it. I didn't, of course, at that time, there was no internet. There was no, no websites. Yeah. And, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't even Google the term. Um, I was sitting at my desk and I was at, at this seven, I was turning 60, um, actually, no, 57 it was. And um, I had exactly this question in mind of where do I begin to become a painter? How do I learn anything about this? Because I've been so isolated just being an architectural renderer in a studio. The first thing I did was I went down to Barnes & Noble and I bought myself every art magazine I could find. Uh, prior to that, I did not subscribe to any magazines whatsoever. I came across Plein Air magazine. I came across Artists magazine, um, uh, Artist International magazine, uh, all of them. Not only did I learn from the different painters that I could read the articles from, I'm, I'm a bit of a picture person. I don't always read the text, but if I find the artwork I really love, I will read every bit, and then I will go and Google that person. I went to the backs of the magazines, and I looked at the people who were giving workshops. I looked them up, and then I looked at competitions. I looked at places where events were being held, and um, I then joined my local watercolor association, which was the California uh, Watercolor Association. I then found out from them, I, by attending their monthly meetings, uh, they had books at the back and they had workshops at the back. I don't take workshops. I've really only taken one workshop, workshop mainly because I'm so self-driven with my own questions and, uh, and 
wanting to paint so much. But that's how I began, Eric. How did you end up at the convention? Plein Air magazine. Oh, and no. Actually, the, how I ended up at the convention was the first workshop I took was in Carmel. And um, the convention was on the week after. And I met some painters uh, because I, it was the first plein air workshop I'd ever gone to. I actually had gone because I didn't know how to undo the, my French easel box. <laughs> so I signed up for this class um, from the recommendation of Thomas Schaller, actually, who said to me, who's a, an amazing watercolorist, to take this work, workshop. And at it, I met these artists who said that they were going to the plein air convention and, in Monterey. And I think that was your second one, correct? Correct. Okay. And then... Because I couldn't get to it, I then it was on my calendar, um, and then I went to the plein air magazines and looked it up and then attended the first one in Monterey, and I've been ever since. Ah, great. Thank you for doing that. Well, and, and ironically, now you're teaching at the plein air convention. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Life has amazing surprises. I mean, I was very complimented to be invited to do that. But, yeah, it's the plein air convention has definitely probably been the greatest influence on my career as a plein air painter and cemented um, not only my feet into the ground, um, it has connected me with the most extraordinary fellow painters. Um, it has exposed me to... Um, a world that I did not realize was so accessible. I mean, plein air painting is very accessible. My studio is outdoors now. I don't even have a studio. I just closed my, you know, bricks and mortar studio because my studio is now outdoors. So I consider that, you know, plein air painting is this world that's unlimited. Why watercolor? <sighs> Why watercolor? Uh, my father was an architect and painted in watercolor. So if anything, even though I did acrylic when I was young, um, watercolor is associated with architectural rendering. So we didn't use it that much in college, but it was uh, very transportable. I'm not a person who's um, into toxic things. I, I live a very clean life. Um, meaning health-wise, I eat organic food and um, I just prefer to not be around toxic smells and oil was not accessible and watercolour was. I could travel with it. I took watercolours with me around the world. Um, so I think that's where it initially stemmed from. But watercolour is also very fascinating because of its um, translucency. Uh, it's not opaque. The opaque comes at the end um, when you're putting in your final darkest darks. But it's it's this amazing gossamer-like layering that is unlimited. It, I feel as though it's like looking into the clouds and it's you can go further and further and further and further. And that's what I love about watercolor. So, Barbara, how do you pick your subjects? Um, because you're not you're, you're not going out and painting architecture. I mean, I know you are from time to time, but you're a landscape painter. What, what? I'm an urban landscape painter. Okay. I, I I've been known to say that I don't paint trees. <laughs> I paint I paint the wood that they comes from trees that gets made into buildings and <laughs> wharves and things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm really an urban. I love the grit. I love factories. I like coasts. I like wharves. I like man-made objects a little bit more. The landscape tends to be uh, the background, much like theater. You know, it's the set. So but you're really the, you're really looking for subjects that are telling a story. I do look for yes, yeah. I'm very subject and um, story driven. I often a, a title will will jump into mind. I'm, I'm at the moment painting down in uh, Point Richmond, and I'm um, painting this great big enormous uh, victory ship called Red Oak Victory, and. Uh, 
the the landscape is the clouds that come in and the fog that surround this massive vessel. Um, and I'm loving that. It's a very important part of the painting, but it is not about the sky. It's about these huge man-made objects that sort of punctuate the sky. Hmm. Interesting. So where do you get your inspiration? Curiosity, naturally born with it. I'm, I'm one of those dreadful children who was always, why, why, why? Um, uh, I'm a visual person terribly visual um i i think because of going and drawing all these houses for years and years and years i i witnessed many different ways that people live because the the houses that i drew were not for the affluent they were everything i drew very simple modest homes to some very very beautiful homes but in my travels i got to see mankind and how areas were changing and I think as an observer uh, that's the curiosity that I have and I want to talk about my world in my paintings um, you know whether I find an audience or not I don't know but I I'm very driven to say I see the world a little differently and I would like to paint about this and talk about it through paint no I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, I wrote something about something that you were doing. You and I were set up uh, pretty much side by side. We were painting the rocky coast of Maine at Fall Color Week, I don't know, a year or two ago. And a last couple, year. Was it last year? And a couple came yeah. up, and they, yeah. com they commented on your painting. Tell me that story and what happened from there. Okay, um, so that was actually the first day that we were all together and we were painting so that we could see Cadillac Mountain in the distance. And um, on September 1st, uh, which was five weeks earlier, I think, um, I had, would, had taken on the Strata Easel Challenge, which is a challenge that's on uh, Facebook. I'm a very media, I love social media, so Instagram and Facebook are important parts of my um, daily routine. Uh, anyway, um, with this Strata Easel Challenge, you get to paint every single day. And I decided that I would paint and give away a painting every day. And what would happen is that um, if somebody engaged me uh, as they were walking by, as the painting was being completed, I would offer it to them. So fast forward six weeks later, I'm in Maine, and here we are back again painting as a group. Um, of 90 odd people and this couple and, and, came and, and emphasis on odd <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway um, generally if I was in a tourist place there'd be tourists coming by and there was this very nice man and wife who were um, standing not far away and, and sort of having a look at what I was doing so I just turned around to them and offered it to them there and what I found, Eric, is that people in these tourist places generally came with a family or a memory or a, there was a girl who was there with her mother saying, um, my mother talked about this particular inspiring spot and I'm bringing her back in her 70s because this was something that I grew up with. And I felt here's an opportunity to enhance their lives by giving them a gift that will be a memory forever. Um, and so that's why I started doing it. And, and so what, what are some of the results that you've experienced? <laughs> I have friends all over the world. Um, I have a lady who regularly writes to me on Facebook. Um, that painting went to Brisbane. I have a young man who was walking out of the water down in Laguna Beach and he came up these stairs past me and I said to him, you know, would you like this painting? And he just, he beamed at me and he said, you wouldn't believe it. He says, I came home to visit my parents. Um, I live in Spain and I've been there for 10, 15 years. And he said, as a child, I went down here and swam every day. And he said, you're going to give me a painting of my favorite swimming hole and I'm going to get to take it back to Barcelona. Um, and then I have two ladies in Maine 
one of whom this morning posted on Facebook a picture of her gorgeous dog, Jack. Um, and she and I encountered each other while she was walking the dog. I ended up having cups of tea with her. Well, uh, uh, it's a year later and we're still talking to each other. Um, so that gives you an example of a co- you know, two or three people there. It's been amazing. So how many paintings have you given away? At least 65. And hmm. it's still going. Now... The, the skeptic in me and the skeptic in some of the people listening are like, well, yeah, but aren't you devaluing plein air painting <laughs> by giving it away? The value is in giving the gift. I have received most extraordinary hugs from people. It, it has given back to me. There is no value. People don't necessarily, these are everyday people. They probably don't invest in art. But I've given them something that is, it's intangible. It is this exchange between human beings. And there's a lot of bad news around, particularly last year, I felt that things weren't, you know, the world wasn't too good a place. And if you can exchange affection or love or um, warmth between another human being, to me, that is a reward in itself. So that's the reward I got, a series of hugs. Well, I think there's also something else to it. And, and um, I remember the first time I, I bought an original painting. And I bought it in, I think it was, you know, a street painting in New Orleans or something. And probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago. And uh, once I had an original painting in my house, I could no longer stand to look at posters. <laughs> And that's that's when the addiction began. So maybe you know maybe there's something else to that too. Well, I can add to that. I bought my first painting, original painting, when I was 18 years old, and it's hanging over our bed right now. Um, I only have original artwork in this house. So I began as an 18 year old, and my whole house is full of original artwork. So. You're right, it it does begin an appreciation. And maybe that I gave all these paintings away that people have realized there is value in art, and I have no idea. Well, I I think it's beautiful, and we kind of went back to Fall Color Week and talked about it to the group, and then everybody else started giving away a painting once in a while. And and everybody felt so good about it. it It was like, you know, not everything has to be about take. And I think you really... You really demonstrated that and, and set a really nice precedent for everybody. So thanks for Eric, that. Eric, there's, there's one thing about this also is that we as artists, if we are working on our craft all the time, um, we're not necessarily producing masterpieces. Um, those masterpieces are a very special time for us where we really devote ourselves to something. But in plein air, it, they're... they're Paintings in, in, in production un, or in construction, they're not necessarily finished paintings. That's a very big difference between plein air and studio work. Oh, you're going to get a few people who are going to write you a nasty note from, from that statement. Well, I, let me explain. I, <laughs> I don't paint in the studio. So I do finished work in the field. All right. um, I'm, I'm actually... A, a, an a la prima painter I paint nearly ni- 99 to 100 percent of my painting is completed in the field so I consider that my work is finished but many painters don't consider that uh, plein air painters so have I got myself out of that I don't know you'll I'll, you know let me know let me know how it goes <laughs> Well, they're welcome to chat to me. I don't mind if they want to talk to me. I'm not a, I do not profess to be a knowledgeable person. I'm a, uh, about the world of art. I'm very self-taught. Um, so, you know, bring it on if they want to have that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you working on now? You said you were working on this ship. Um, is, are you doing a series of paintings on this ship or what? what, what? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting for me, my motivation often is to, uh, through curiosity, is that it's not just a one shot at something. If I go out, um, generally, uh, one, a story will uh, expose itself. Um, two is I will find a thread. And 
Um, I found a thread last year in Berkeley locally and ended up painting for actually about 45 days straight in this one area. Um, and that's grown into an amazing project. Um, I produced a book from it and then I now get invited to take people on walks with the books in hand and I show people how much change has occurred. I, I was capturing uh, buildings going under construction and uh, buildings being torn down. I was capturing uh, graffiti uh, that has been painted over since then. So this was an area of change. Um, so I love doing series. I'll do, I painted my interior of my house last year. Uh, things that you, everyday things that you see every day and then um, it's really nice to actually sort of put the time in and actually paint them. Um, and then at the moment, now I'm down at this shipyard uh, painting a victory ship called a Red Oak um, Victory. And uh, it's amazing. I go down every day and I'm particularly interested in the evenings because the evening light brings in a whole new set of colors onto this very dull, you know, World War II gray hull, um, which is mammoth. It's quite an extraordinary piece of um, man-made, you know, construction in steel. Uh, plus, there is a uh, whirly crane that's um, positioned right beside it, and on the top of that is an eagle's nest. Um, but it's a very fascinating, um, and already I'm six days into it uh, of ex exploring this whole area and just painting every single day there. So yeah, I'm very series-driven. I find um, that what appears at first is just a superficial um, assessment of something and then the further that you go into it, I might find even a story about a, a gangplank. So I just did this painting yesterday and there's this marvellous gangplank that's sort of launching itself off the side of the hull of this ship um, and it created a very exciting dynamic piece of design uh, into the painting and then uh, day before I did uh, this looming hull coming forward t towards you um, so there's always something out there if you have a series because you go back and you go back and you go back well I used to live out there as you know and, and although mm -hmm. we didn't know each other at the time no, uh, you and, lived over the hill <laughs> yeah yeah I was just over the hill you, you were where yeah. all the fog was yeah, um, we were. <laughs> but, you know, the, the Bay Area uh, is such a fantastic area for painting because it's such a, it, there's so much diversity. You know, you can, yes. uh, what I always loved about it is, you know, where, where you, you live in Berkeley, right? Yes. Yeah, and, the, and so, you know, Berkeley had its own its own thing, but, you know, you could find water, you could find crashing hit rocks, you could find rolling green hills or rolling golden hills, depending on the time of year. Of course, you had the city and the buildings and the bridge and the the and former, redwoods. the redwoods and the former uh, World's Fair. What do they call that? The Pacific uh, something or Exposition. other. Exposition. Exposition, yeah, which is a really great favorite painting spot. You've got wine country. Um, you know, you're within really within uh, two hours if you want to go down to Carmel and and go down to the the coast down there. So, you know, that's a, what a great area to it's paint. It's a great geographic location. It, it, it's actually what appealed to my husband and I. We were from Sydney, Australia, and San Francisco Bay has an enormous amount of diversity, as you said. Um, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful bay, and you've got Golden Gate Park and the Presidio and then uh, uh, Golden Gate Bridge, and we have the Bay Bridge, and then now we've got the whole of South of Mission, which is a huge industrial uh, explosion that's happening down there. I was just painting down there with a group of urban painters uh, last week, and it's absolutely fascinating what's happening to the waterfront all along there. So you're right, and, and of course you're going to have the convention coming up in April. Yeah. Yeah, so what... You know, we've been hearing a lot of stuff on the news about the homeless people and the the problems mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that. Uh, and I've had a couple people call and ask, should they be concerned? What's, what's your thought on that? 
Uh, when we're part of the plein air convention, you are part of the plein air convention, and it's a, it's all consuming. Um, the the homeless issue is very visual. It's part of the colour of our city. It's uh, it's non-threatening. It's um, it's a dynamic, flowing. Thing. So you might see a group in one position one day, uh, they won't be there the next day. So it's something that is part of the colour of this city. And I embrace it. I, I mean, um, it's, it's a beautiful place to live. It's an incredible climate to live here. I mean, it's not easy for these people. But when we're part of the convention itself, you'll find that uh, the places that we go to paint it probably won't be where a lot of the homeless people are. Um, but then if you see any of the homeless people, say hello. Yeah, well, you know? you're, you're going to, you know, there's always been homeless people in San Francisco. Right? But, you know, yeah. when we go down to to uh, Chrissy Field to paint the 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 bridge, we're not going to see mm-hmm. them. If, you, if we go to the Pacific Exposition to paint that, if we go over to the coast of the crashing rocks and the waves, uh, you know, certainly not going to see it up in wine country or anybody wants to go out to the redwoods, you know, you're not going to see it there. It, it's, it's tends to be kind of congregated in parts of the city. Yeah. Uh, in from the mission I, district and that. Yeah. Look again, it's, it's everywhere. It's life. Yeah. And come to San Francisco to celebrate the life that we have and, <clears throat> and recognize that it is a marvelous climate in which to live. And, um, that is only part of the pastiche or the mosaic or the um, patchwork quilt of San Francisco. Yeah. Um, it won't affect the plein air. And if it does, it'll affect part of the urban side of, of life. But here, this, the concentration will be on our landscape, and the landscape is extraordinary. Yeah. All right. Well, I was just curious about that. I, you know, it's it's kind of the elephant in the room, and I don't necessarily like to talk about things like that. But I also know that some people are, you know, they're not used to that. Maybe they're not seeing that where they live. But uh, having lived out there for ten years, you know, it was just mm-hmm. kind of part of everyday life. It, it, look, it's coastal. It's San. It's it's California. Yeah. It, it's everywhere. I mean, I. You're going to see, you know, we have a, a, a large migrant population who are here and they're looking for work. And so you'll see the workers out on the streets. But, you know, this is a very cosmopolitan city. It's a very exciting city. It's a city with uh, great diversity in the choices of where you can eat, and where you can shop. And the things that you can do, you can ride cable cars, you can hop on a ferry and go to Alcatraz Island. You can well, you hop know, on we're... A ferry. We're only about, uh, I, th- I think we're about two blocks from Chinatown where we're holding Fabulous. the convention. We're two blocks from the St. Francis Square. There, you know, that's kind of where yeah, people... Union Square. Union Square. That's where they, yep. you know, they catch the streetcars. So I think there's going to be a lot of diversity, you know, so I think it's going to be pretty cool. Oh, and then, and then you have our incredible topography. The top of California Street to look down to the Embarcadero. I mean, the scale of the heights that the hills go to is really dynamic. Yeah, Brian. And down to Fisherman's Wharf. Brian Mark Taylor and I did a video uh, of him at the bottom of one of those hills and basically him painting the street all the way up the hill. (laughs) (laughs) It was really fun. Well, listen, I didn't didn't intend to turn this into a uh, San Francisco postcard, but of course we would sure. we would love people to come if they want to come. The uh, last but not least, tell me a little bit about uh, work in plein air events because it sounds like something you're doing a little bit of, or maybe more of. I don't know. Um, I've had a wonderful experience doing plein air events so far. Um, upcoming, I have Borrego Springs, which is an invitational in March. And then next year, I haven't really planned my year. Um, this year, I was able to do uh, an event in Pennsylvania, which was my first time traveling across the country. Uh, the thing about the plein air events is it gives you this opportunity to come in and paint intensely for a week in an environment that you don't know. So, you know, people get to go and do the Grand Tetons and, uh, all over the place. They... Um, up the peninsula in um, Seattle. Uh, I do them 
I apply to them purely because it does give me this opportunity to go and paint in an area that I don't know. I come in with very fresh eyes. I like to arrive two or three days ahead so that I can actually get a pulse. Um, I also, when I do go to these events now, I paint on a theme, um, which is probably a little different to most uh, plein air painters who go in to do events. But uh, I just recently completed one at Alameda and I concentrated on life on the estuary. So every single painting I did had to relate to the estuary itself. And it gave me an opportunity to do uh, boat yards, um, the kids sailing in the afternoons, um, things like that. Um, yeah, and then I've just been invited to actually submit a painting that's going to go to China um, as a representation of watercolour in California. So that's a fun event. Um, there's competitions that I enter as well that are coming up. Um, Excellent. Well, last, la last but not least, um, to anybody who's listening who is kind of on the fence about should I consider this whole plein air thing, what would you say? Oh, what would I say about that? Well, it's changed my life. <laughs> Um, it, it's connected me to the outdoors. It's connected me to um, people. Um, it's uh, it's quite extraordinary when you go out and you paint plein air. You um, you bring all your gear, and you have you're exposed to all the weather, and you're exposed to you've got to feed yourself. You've got to, I, as I pour water, fresh water into my container for um, my watercolors, I always take a swig of water too so you get dehydrated. Um, there is a, you can become so engaged when you're out there painting that you actually lose complete awareness of where you are. And if you're standing by the side of the sea, you are fully encompassed in the moment and it's a painting it's a t thing about painting in the moment and it's intoxicating it's um you come home with your whole mind consumed with the memory of what it felt to be there all your senses are engaged um and then if you go with friends you can share your paintings you you are painting a similar scene maybe it's of the golden gate bridge or or of a mountain or the coastline down in Post Lo um, Lobos, Point Lobos. Um, and you actually can put all the paintings out together and say, wow, you know, you got that wave or wow, you got that tree or you got that. And it's a social event as much as it's isolating being on your own. That's why I call it the new golf. You know, it's like it's challenging. Oh, you, you, you always call it the new golf. I know. I don't. It's not I don't the play new golf. I don't play golf, but, but it's you know it's challenging. It's something that you can do that's outdoors. You're, it's social. You know, it's got a lot of those those same benefits. It really does. Yeah. And and your conventions. Uh, look, anybody who's listening to this, who's on the fence about going to the conventions, honestly, it changed my life. I, I learnt. Um, a, in one, what, four days, you are exposed to the most extraordinary things that are happening, that other people are painting techniques. I, I just say thank you very did much. You, did you feel a little bit insecure? Uh, because I'll hear from somebody once in a while, they'll say, well, I'm not worthy to go because I'm not a good enough painter or I, you know, I don't want to paint in front of other people because I'm a little embarrassed by it. Uh, what would you say to I those had people? that. You I, did. I, I, hundred percent, Eric. I, I hadn't even established myself uh, in any comfort level of painting plein air, and I think you have to go with a grain of uh, adventure. You have to say, I'm actually going to do something. I have no idea what effect this is going to have on me, um, and you go with trepidation. And you, it's like a smorgasbord. I mean, you are faced that first year. I'll never forget. Um, I, I just walked around with a, like a deer in headlights. Um, but I took away such a desire to learn more um, that then it propelled me like, I can't wait till the next one. 
and then the next one you come in as quite a different person you you're able to sort of choose more carefully because you learnt from the first time of oh my goodness I overate um, <laughs> the second time you go oh my goodness no I'm not going to overeat and so you you pull back a little bit the third time you get it down the fourth time you're an addict and the fifth time you're so disappointed when it's over you just can't wait for the next year to come so I think it's six years I've I will be going and you know and and that little person that walked in there with that trepidation I ended up being on the faculty so you know that's extraordinary in itself well you you know you're living an extraordinary life and and uh, you're such a gift to those of us in the plein air community it's been such a pleasure to get to know you you have uh, it to, to watch your career soar in the fact that you just kind of decided seven years ago to take up plein air painting and now you're teaching it at the convention, you're doing, uh, you know, workshops and plein air events and, and you know, it's it's transformational to, to see what's happened to you and it's, it's a, a real gift that you've brought all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. Author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. Thanks again to Barbara Tapp. She is a true hero of mine. A real sweet and quality person, uh, willing to give, and uh, wow, what a rock star painter she has become. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your marketing questions. You can email me your questions, Eric at plenairmagazine.com. Here's a question from Karen Halbert of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Karen asks, is it okay to post sold paintings on social media, Facebook, Instagram, etc.? Karen, why wouldn't you? Posting something you've sold does two things. It tells people that you're actively selling your work. It also tells people that people are buying your work. People appreciate your work. And I think it's a really great thing to do. And by the way, don't just post it once. Post it multiple times. Repeat it. Don't do it the same day. But not everybody sees everything you post. People see things randomly. So it's okay to repeat things. You could you could put things up that you sold five years ago. I don't think it'll matter. You could say, here's a painting that, that sold. I would also recommend... Uh, including your name, your website, and uh, the image in some way so that when they share it, uh, people will find you. Of course, your copyright also. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you shouldn't be posting certain things on social media like your head in a toilet. Well, I suppose you could do that if that's the image you're trying to project. But I would be cautious about posting works in progress. Now, if there are collectors that happen to stumble into your site, they Google you, they find you on Facebook, and they see a piece of unfinished work, you're kind of beating your chest and saying, hey, look at me, look at what I can do. But, you know, if you, if you post an unfinished piece of work, uh, work in progress. Not everybody really gets that. Collectors don't really understand the painting process. They might look at it, not read what you say, see something that's substandard or not finished, and think that you're not really as good as you really are. So I think you want to be really careful, be discerning. Um, most artists are blind to the fact that they're possibly damaging their image, damaging their image with potential collectors by posting something incomplete. And be careful that you reinforce your image. Whatever your image is, whatever you want your image to be, don't do anything that's counter to your image because what you put on social media can show up from 10 years from now. Uh, also, share selectively, right? Artists who are believed to be masters from the past, the present, Nobody saw every painting they did. I guarantee you that da Vinci did paintings that he never showed anybody or, or Michelangelo. You know, nobody sees the dogs. You don't want to show anybody the dogs. We all have dogs. You want to edit selectively. Only put the best stuff out there. You know, don't be worrying about beating your chest and saying, hey, look at me. Be worried about, hey, does this look good? Sometimes a glass of wine before we're online uh, kind of impairs our judgment. And, you know, next thing you know, you're putting all this stuff up there that really shouldn't be there. So be careful. The only other thing I'd say to you is, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are getting angry on social media because of political opinions or religious opinions or things that just might be polarizing. And I know an artist who actually got uninvited to a pretty major plein air event because this artist was sharing 
uh, things on social media that the um, the people who were putting the event on felt would hurt their event one way or the other because of their customers or maybe because somebody in the organization didn't like it. I don't know the story behind that, but you want to be careful about that. Next question is from Oksana Johnson of San Francisco. I hope I got that name right. I hope I didn't butcher it. Uh, when is the right time to raise your prices? Well, pricing's a very important issue. Um, lots of great books on pricing. I just read a good one. I wish I could think of the name of it. But anyway, there are several factors that go into price. Price kind of sends a signal of quality, and you want to be careful about that. Prices need to be same everywhere. In other words, if uh, somebody wanders into Gallery A and looks at your work, and they wander to Gallery B, they look at your work, it's the same price for the same size. People will Google you. If it's lower in one place and higher where they are, they're not going to like that, and it's going to drive a negotiation down. Your price has everything to do with your brand, how well-known you are. So some of the best painters in the world are unknown and can't get a fraction of the value they should be getting because nobody knows who they are. The stronger your brand, the higher your price. And if you think your brand is strong, think again. Most people who think their brand is strong don't really have a strong brand. I mean, there are painters that are world-famous to us that nobody in America knows who they are. So think about what you can do to build your brand in the eyes of collectors, because collectors, you know, you, yeah, your brand matters to artists too if you want them to come to your workshops, but it's the collectors who are going to be supporting you from buying your paintings. So prominence, perception of quality, all impacted by brand. Price is also impacted by your collectability. What makes you collectible? Uh, winning awards, getting critical acclaim, uh, being invited to major events. Uh, these are things that help with your resume, give the galleries a story to talk about or you a story to talk about when you're selling. And uh, enter. Enter everything. Try to win everything. Uh, you know, it's a good investment. It's uh, a good way to keep yourself out there. Also, sales um, environments impact things. For instance, if you're at an art fair, um, you know, you could probably sell at a lower price because it's not a big deal. If somebody does Google you, they find it at a gallery. But that's a local exception, not something you want to do everywhere. And certainly I wouldn't do it at a plein air show because in the plein air community, you know, everybody talks to everybody, everybody knows what's going on. Um, the other thing you want to be careful about is uh, your fellow artists. Now, you're not allowed to talk to fellow artists about pricing because that's price fixing and that's illegal. But, you know, there are some, some reputation issues out there. There are artists who come into a, sh to a show and they'll drop their prices 80% lower than everybody else. Then everybody buys that stuff. That artist does well, but then he doesn't get, or she doesn't, or whomever doesn't get invited back to the show. The other artists don't feel very good about them. So you want to try to kind of be in the same range or, you know, yeah, it's okay to be higher, but be really careful about that because you can hurt your reputation and you might get short-term gain, but long-term you may be hurting yourself. Um, also, uh, the best way to see prices soar is to get talked about as a top artist, get invited into the top shows, things like Pre to West, which is like a great thing to get invited into. And you want to have scarcity. Um, I would rather see you paint fewer paintings and bigger paintings and get a higher price for bigger paintings and scarcity than everybody thinking, well, here's this person who's pumping out 300 paintings, 400, 500 paintings a year. That's going to keep your prices low no matter what you do. And you look at a great artist like George Carlson. I mean, George produces three or four paintings a year and he gets a huge price for him. And he had the guts to ask for a huge price right out of the box, uh, trying to get paid for his time. And it worked out for him. Uh, but he also got invited to the top shows. And so you want to kind of really work on getting invited to the top shows and becoming a premium brand. And avoid the temptation of discounting. Rolls-Royce would never discount. And you want to be somewhere up there. You want to be a Rolls-Royce, right? You ultimately want to be one of the best painters out there. Well, today's podcast was sponsored by the Plen Air Convention. You can learn more. I hope you'll come. Plen Air Convention. Dot com. That's where you learn about it. And also by Streamline, premium art instruction video. That's at StreamlineArtVideo.com. I've got this blog I do on Sunday mornings. It's called Sunday Coffee. And if you want to sign up for it, it's up to over 100,000 people now getting it. You can uh, go on CoffeeWithEric.com and sign up. It'll come to you automatically. Uh, this is fun. I like doing it. Let's do it again next week. I'll see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes, and I'm the publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. And it's a big, beautiful world. You need to go paint it. We'll see you. Bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. 
You can help spread the word about plein air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.